Hello and welcome to this week's Out of Cats, your program completely in English to improve your knowledge about cinema. I'm Helio the Bluehead. Today with my friend and colleague Twinkle Nora, and today we will be talking about my my hour. I mean, it's my personal favorite. If the if someone would come to me and ask me who is your all-time favorite director, I would definitely say Stanley Kubrick. I mean, I love this guy. He, his work is awesome, and he's a perfectionist. I'm sort of a perfectionist, so Aww, yeah, I kind of relate. <laughs> I kind of relate to the guy. So yeah, we are uh, going to talk about Stanley Kubrick. But to do this amazing director justice, we're gonna talk about him not just today but also next week. So we decided to make you know a uh, two episode program about yeah. this perfectionist director, just like Helia. Yeah. So uh, before heading to the conversation and talking about the movies, let's get to our socials. Oh, you're all right. You can find <laughs> us on our Facebook page as Roma Tree Radio and on our Twitter account as Roma Tree Radio on Instagram. Hmm. hmm. So <laughs> Sorry, I had to say it. You Every can find time. Us on Instagram, Roma Tree Radio, and of course, you can listen to our streaming website as radio.uniromatree.it and on the tuning app as Roma Tree Radio. Get a hot cup of tea with light just like us, and um, let's get to a song. Listen to a bit of a music in this cold weather. A sip of a tea, and we'll be get to you soon. Jack, <laughs> it doesn't make too much noise. No, no, I didn't think that it would make so much noise, and then it was a horrible decision, really. Okay, so let's. I mean, I'm just so hyped for this for, to talk about Stanley Kubrick. Uh, as I said, he's my favorite uh, director of all time. And without any further ado, let's let's talk about uh, his early life and career. Oh yeah, can can I say it? Can yeah. I? Oh, thank you so you much. You will start. Oh, thank you. So we can start by saying that well, Stanley Kubrick was born in 1922 in New York to a Jewish family, and ever since he was a kid, he didn't show any particular interest in to studying. So that's why, right after he finished his high school, he went straight to fully dedicate himself to be a freelance photographer for Look. And it soon became a full-time job, like he was only 90 years old at the time, but he was considered by his colleagues as a job veteran. I mean, have you seen his photographs? Yeah. He's awesome. He is, I mean, visionary. I, I, I can't, the words are not just enough. We have to uh, come up with a made-up, uh, you know, word. Yeah, really. <laughs> uh, hmm. He even, he even said that he spent his entire life uh, with uh, his photo camera. So that's, that's true. So you can, it, it shows. You can see it in the photographs. He's done many photographs with the, his photo cameras. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, he never thought about becoming a filmmaker ever. And that probably could uh, actually happen if only on one day of 1984, he hadn't been forced to do a photo shot of a boxer called Walter Cartier. And from that photo session, Kubrick, for some reason, he didn't actually know why, he couldn't help himself by thinking about a movie where he follows the boxer until the day of, of a big match, and some, for some reason, this idea will later become his first show movie, Day of a Fight from 1951, and that's it, Kubrick now wanted to be a famous director, and, well, well the, happened. the rest is the history, I guess. Yeah. There is this movie history and inspiring many, many um, filmmakers. I mean, the generations after him. Totally. Like from Fats of Glory, Doctor Strangelove, oh, Shining, God, to yeah. Fast and Wild, Space Odyssey. Kubrick, you know. Yeah. I mean, he might have left us 20 years ago. Yeah, but now. Still is but most, to people know yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, most of his uh, films will carry on forever. I mean, look. When you have a director like this, that is that is affecting still many generations after him, many filmmaker makers after him. Well, I mean, it's just I am speechless about this person. How awesome and visionary he is! Um, what a perfectionist guy, and what a you know perfect guy to talk about this passionately about. 
Oh, I love the tea. Oh, yeah, big same. Hello, welcome back to Aftercast. This is Twinkle Nora. And this is Helga the Blue Head. And we were talking about uh, Stanley Kubrick. And right now we are going to talk about fear and desire coming from out. Nine, from 1953. Yeah. And well, in his directional debut, he also produced and edited and filmed the entire movie himself. That's impressive. Jesus Christ. Totally. And so, yeah. Now, before making this full-length future film, he made two short films, just like I said before. Yes. And uh, Day of a Fight, but also Flying Padre. Oh, Flying Padre surely <laughs> is something to talk about. Yes. Uh, <laughs> flying Prize. Uh, wow. Lovely. <laughs> So, interestingly, the movie was made by a production team and only 15 people. What? Yeah. A full fe feature length film? With 15 people. With only 15. himself and the actor. Yeah, of course, I could. <laughs> <laughs> Look, he has directed, he has produced, he has, he has done the cinematography, he has edited, he has done four jobs, four major jobs of the movie. <laughs> yeah. Which is, I mean. It's just something. The she, guy is she genius. Really has to have been a lot of stress. <laughs> the guy is a genius. And lots of caffeine. <laughs> yes, <laughs> also that. So, Fear and Desire is an anti war movie telling the story of four soldiers crunching landing six miles behind enemy lines. Uh, the country's names were unidentified and trying to get into the trench or country without the enemy noticing using a raft or a river to get to their destination. So, yeah, uh, look, the movie had low budget, it, the limited cast and crew, as we said, 15 people. And I mean, that's why Kubrick done many things himself. And one of the cast did actually two major, had, had two major parts. One of the cast acted at two separate characters and major, major ones, you know. And the movie has some, you know, very good lines also, very wise actually, that it also can be used as life lessons, many of them told by the narrator. Now, it's the editing and the shots that you realize how much the young Kubrick is inspired by Sergei Eisenstein, uh, Giga Vertov and the Kuleshov effect. Uh, and yes, you heard me correctly. In many sequences, the editing and how it's done and the impact it has on the audience it directly addresses to the famous odessa steps seen from the battleship potemkin and you might know that uh, uh, to eleanor because you are a you're a cinema student i'm a cinema i mean and the movie buffs would know that scene from um, you know the o odessa steps yep uh, but f um, if you don't know what we're talking about, because Stanley Kubrick was highly inspired uh, by the Soviet montage. It was a movement in cinema, uh, especially in this movie. It just shows, it's, it damn shows and it's so obvious. And if you don't know, if you're a, a normal uh, listener that you're not uh, educated in cinema, it, let's put it that way, in a very simple way, that the Soviet montage is a pretty important uh, movement in movie history uh, that um, you know highlighted the importance of editing. So yeah, yeah um, it, it was also basically the first ever school of um, you know editing ever in uh, the movie media. So. Yeah, it was really important. But in the end, what can I, what what we can say to you is that this is a must-watch movie for uh, cinema lovers and students. And it only has 62 minutes runtime, uh, but note that this is not a movie for everyone. A soft mouth was the road to sin, Mr. Violence. That's Killer's Kiss from 1955. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> you got me missed it. Soft mouth was the road to sin, Mr. Violence. <laughs> Um, well, as you will guess, it was a very mainstream noir slogan. Yeah, it's not something you would expect. It makes sense in the fifties. The movie came out in nineteen fifty-five, so it makes sense. Yeah, and that's the reason also why Killer's Case is likely to be, you know, left out of the conversation talking about Kubrick. <laughs> 
Uh, so, following his first 1953 Dead of the Future film, Fear and Desire, Kieliski stars Jamie Smith as David Gordon, Irene Kane as Booker Price. But Miss Irene Kane will later be famous for the New as the New York Times writer Chris Chase. Uh, she was also became a writer talking about um, fat uh, loss <laughs> for oh. some reason, you know. And finally, Frank Silvera as Vincent Rapallo, the main villain of the story. And uh, I gotta, I gotta say, I yeah. did. Uh, Frank Silvera was in most of Kubrick's early movies. Yeah, just like you almost West at some point. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, she the, has, uh, that's he has the Kubrick a, family. Yeah, exactly. The exactly Kubrick what family. I wanted to. Bum, bum. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, ba, 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 ba. oh yeah, it even features Kubrick's then wife. Uh, oh yeah, Sabaska, but you know how many times do these men get married anyway? I don't know. I have no. I really. Fourth. I don't know uh, much about his personal life. To be perfectly like honest. Fourth times. I don't know. So let's move on. So, doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I just want to say it. So, um, Killer's Kiss is truly a conventional noir story being written by Howard Sackler, who is best known for Broadway plays. <laughs> so, okay. The plot follows Jimmy Smith, who is a boxer who wants to rescue dance old girl Irene Kane from the maneuvers of a, of a club owner, Frank Severa. Yeah, really impressive. Yeah. Um, hmm. Okay. <laughs> so you won't believe this, but it even has a happy ending. Yeah. Now it's not like really Kubrick's type. Kubrick, yeah, it's not his type. Uh, but he actually it's didn't not, want this. No, he didn't really didn't want it. But since he was forced by the United Artists production, I mean, there was production, but he also found the movie himself. Hmm? How how United Artists was uh, produced the movie, mm -hmm. and he himself Kubrick. Uh, raised forty thousand dollars as his budget. I mean, uh, then of, what's it's the kind job of, of the producer? It's sort of complicated because United Artists not a uh, conventional producer. I mean, it's a, um, a production company yeah. made by artists by themselves. Yes. So they said we won't distribute your film if you don't put an happy. So ending. they're distributor. They distribute and, and also, and also the movie. Producer. It's kind of complicated. I don't get America. I yeah yeah neither do I, because I mean look, uh, distributor and production. You know there are different companies. Um, it is uh, the production companies fund the movie. The distributor uh, distributes the movie. I mean it's pretty obvious. But uh, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So <laughs> the budget was uh, was raised by his relatives. And um, no known information is available on the historical box office, but we can say for sure that it, it has uh, won a prize back in 1959. I mean, four years after the movie came out yep. at the Locarno International Film Festival as Best Director to Stanley Kubrick on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, it, ha it is certified fresh by the critics thanks to 84%. Uh, meanwhile, the audience didn't like it so much, so they gave it... So they gave it 59%. So let's go back to uh, other movies that he's done right after uh, The Killer's Kiss, which came out in 1955, came out The Killing, coming out in 1956. I mean, year by year, he... he the kill, kill, kill. <laughs> kill, kill. I like the word kill. Let's make 2,000 <laughs> films about it. So, yeah. So, it talks about an exit convict named Johnny Clay who tells his girlfriend Faye that he has plans for making money and indeed he has. He runs uh, up a gang and brings them in an old seemingly foolproof scheme to rob a rent strike of uh, two hundred thousand dollars. The first thread unreels when Sherry Petey, wife of a gang man, gang bad, <laughs> gang bad. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I said a terrible word, please don't search it. <laughs> So there is a big gang member out George of cast. Petey. Out of cast is going in a whole another different direction these <laughs> days. 
<laughs> I was trying to say it. She <laughs> repeated wife of a gang member, George P.D., tells her boyfriend Val Cannon about the plan and he casts himself in on that action. So the robbery is completed and the gang goes to the hideout where Johnny will join them later. Val sticks up the robbers, a shot is fired, and all hands are soon dispatched. Johnny with the money in a suitcase, Johnny Faye at the airport. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, and the rest is movie history. We're not gonna spoil the rest because it's uh, it's literally spoiler the free program. Uh, yeah, until we say spoiler alert, yeah, but it, not it, now it because been 50 years. <laughs> yes, but this is a must-watch movie. But yeah. more on, more on that later. Now the it's a terrific film, great acting, and you can see where the the key shooting scenes in Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs came from with regard to the meet after the robbery. Now the film that this is a film that inspired many heist movies. The bar fight scene where Stanley Kubrick shows uh, in three angles was extremely interesting. Now Kubrick has shown his abilities as a professional director on this movie and his efficiency as a young director is really admirable. Uh, now on Rotten Tomatoes it has got 97% which is really awesome and uh, also tells that why this movie is called one of the best noir movies in film history. And it has a really skillful group uh, of actors and very well known like Sterling Hayden, uh, Colleen Gray and Vince Edwards. Just to name a few. <laughs> <laughs> oui, oui, je, je, je. Oui, oui, parfait. J'aime le baguette. <laughs> I spent three years to study French, French. French stereotypes, and I I spent three years studying French, and I can't remember uh, shit. I can remember one thing. Je m'appelle le pomme de terre. It means I am potato. So, <laughs> so uh, well, uh, talking about the movie, the movie was uh, supposed to be filmed in France, but the French government refused to let that ever happen, so Kubrick and his crew decided to film in West Germany. You may guess why? That was a glorious and Kubrick first take on the war genre, as we said before, the first one being Fear and Desire from 1953, an explicit anti-war film. So perhaps a glory, people were, mm, no, another movie by Kubrick, mm, you should not like this. <laughs> and, <laughs> so perhaps a glory makes actually no difference. It even goes deeper than its first predecessor, becoming a harsh war film with impressive battle sequences never seen before. Now, how However, Kubrick still managed to win a Nasser D'Argento Prize back in 1959 as Best Foreign Director. It's not that much, but Stanley was, you know, pretty, he was cool with it, he was pretty much used to it. Yeah, he just won an Oscar right before he died, right? Yeah, but later, really later on. We're still in 1957, 50, 59. Rest in pieces. Yeah. <laughs> now, Rotten Tomatoes, both the critics and audience score gave a big thumbs up on the movie, giving it a 95% from both sides. And so that's, you know, pretty fresh, like fresh, fresh. Now, however, on the financial point of view, oh <laughs> dear. I mean, it's something unbelievable. Pass of Glory was a, uh, how should we put it, colossal disaster. Yeah, totally. So, to, stay, to say the most, starting from a considerable budget of 935,000, about 1 million, let's say, yeah. be it be the snobbish reception from the critics or countries that refuse to screen the movie or whatever, Paths yeah, of Jill Glory. Yeah, Spain refused to screen the movie for decades. What the fuck? Oh yeah. shit, sorry. <laughs> I'm calling the police. <laughs> she said the F word. Always. Always. Okay. Now, Wait Pass of rules. Glory gained only, guess what? $5,000. Yeah. Yes, 5000 And this is globally, not, you know, not just in the US or not just in the UK. Globally, it earned $5,000. And we mean on its international box office. So even if it didn't become a blockbuster, it still remains one of the most remarkable and well-known war movies of all time. 
five thousand dollars. It's you know. It's crazy, right? Look, it's. I can't believe like, it that $5, that people is... didn't pay to see this movie. Yeah. Let's talk about a glorious movie that came out in 1960, which it's remake in 2016 or 15. I don't know. I didn't follow that. Uh, because was, you really didn't care. <laughs> uh, it was terrifically bad, and it was badly received. So why why would anyone care? <laughs> mm. Sorry. I know it. I know it starred pretty good, pretty much well, you know, well-known actors. But the movie was an unnecessary remake, especially when you're remaking a movie from Stanley Kubrick. Yeah, and that all movie the remakes are useless. Well, not not maybe all of them. I I, I don't want to generalize. Ninety nine percent of them are useless. I don't want to generalize, you know, on that matter because there are some remakes that are really good, but not this one. And yeah, we're gonna we want to talk about Spartacus, the the original one, the, as it's obvious. I mean, yeah. So <laughs> parents need to know that this movie has intense battles, crucifixions, and an off-screen suicide. Also a bit of nudity, slave women are given to men as rewards, and oh my god, yeah, these sort of stuff that you used to- You just described an NCIS episode. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so hilarious, I know. Thank you so much for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> So all of this used to be a thing in uh, ancient Rome. <laughs> yeah. So this epic saga of the price of freedom is really thrilling. You know, it talks about the struggles of conscience and creepy uh, on uh, as the brilliantly staged battle scenes. And when we see first Spartacus, he strikes out of an, an oppressor or more squarely flexibly. Uh, he doesn't really care about the consequences, that he will of course be deaf, as he later says, whereas late deaf is only a uh, release for pain actually, so... Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. I lost myself, where am I? <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> so, uh, look, he said, it, it, it was one of the best lines, I mean, in my opinion, in the mm -hmm. movie. That it, and it was really true, and it was beautifully um, said beautifully delivered in the movie uh, for a slave death is only a release from pain now when he strikes out again later in the film he is armed not only with the fighting skills that uh, he has learned but also with an ability to lead founded in a new sense of entit uh, entitlement uh, to freedom now the characters are uh, especially vivid and interesting. Uh, Variana has a wonderful grace and a rare, a rare humor, which adds warmth to her character. She is able to shield her emotional self from the abuse she is forced to endure uh, without de uh, deadening her feelings. Um, Gracchus uh, conveys uh, the essential uh, decency of a man who has made many compromises, uh, political and spiritual. Now, both the author of the book and the screenwriter were blacklisted during the McCarthy era. Um, and, you know, it's also worth noting that this uh, was among the most popular movie show, uh, movies that were shown in the former uh, Soviet Union. And, uh, I mean, the reason, I think it's pretty obvious because, you know, it's... The freedom um, of slaves and... Exactly. It's obvious. It. It's obvious. It shows. So, oh yeah, we've got Kirk Douglas, who is part of uh, Kubrick's family, just like I said before. Yes. <laughs> He was a certain protagonist of this era, and he has also been chosen by Kubrick to bring up more of a name of himself and help, him, help, me, help, help me, help me, help <laughs> me, and him, and us, and everyone to have bigger projects in the future. So we can't also ignore the presence of Tony Curtis as the role of Antonius, who is the co stars of this movie. And this movie won also four Academy Awards for Best Supporting Actor, Best Cinematography, Costume Designer, and Best Art Direction. Which and is really, I mean, 
it, Kubrick didn't win so much strong for his entire life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm really sorry. It's a meme. And Just like Leonardo DiCaprio. Okay. Yeah, and it, it had other three nominations. It also won Golden, Golden Globe for Globe. Best Picture. Uh, on Rotten Tomatoes, it has also got um, 95% and it earned six, $60 million in the box office, which at that time, it's awesome. Speaking of trouble, <laughs> yeah, the, the the music was troublemaker. So now, speaking of trouble and troublemaker, yeah, yeah let's talk about a movie which is really controversial yeah. movie. When uh, and not just the movie itself, uh, because the movie got remakes as well. That mm -hmm. movie. Uh, also, the movie is based on a novel. The novel was itself so controversial. And we are speaking, uh, we are about Lolita to talk. That from 1960. Yeah, exactly that one. <laughs> I feel anxious talking about Lolita, I must say. <laughs> it's a controversial matter, even now. That's why there are strict rules about this stuff. Um, I mean, yeah. guys, it's even banned in America. It's banned in America, it's banned in Europe, uh, if I'm not mistaken. The only place that it's not banned to have relationship with a minor is uh, in, uh, I think, uh, Muslim countries like mine. I'm from Iran because, you know, that's it's not banned there. They actually encourage grown men to marry uh, minor uh, girls, let's say. Mwah! It's a it's a religion and this sort of stuff. I don't get it. I and obviously as a feminist, I don't support it. Yeah. yeah. But now let's talk about the movie. I don't think about horrible stuff happening in real life. <laughs> so Lolita came out in 1962. Was actually just like you said before, based on a novel by Vladimir Nab Vlad Nabokov. <laughs> yes. And who also actually. Mm, participate in the movie, right? He yeah, he did, he, he wrote, wrote the screenplay. Yep, along with Stanley Kubrick. And you probably find out why the movie and the story is controversial as soon as you hear the story. The story is about Professor Humbert, played by James Mason, who moves to an American suburb, rents a room from uh, from a lonely widow, Charlotte Hayes, played by Shelley Winters, then marries her, but is actually there to uh, have an affair with uh, <coughs> a little girl, daughter. Yeah, this is actually uh, weird. Uh, he is obsessed over the, uh, you know, the teenage daughter. It should be teenager, but in the novel she's twelve years old. So yeah, more on that uh, later. We get to yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So this is all the plot. This man wants to um, do something with his little girl. So that's all, that's all you need to know. Yeah, he is obsessed over. The daughter of the woman he's married to. Oh my god, okay, so as soon as they announced that they, that they want to make a movie based on the novel of Lolita, people freaked out. Many were wondering how are they going to make that into a movie. Well, in fact, the movie was not caught or censored. You know, interestingly. Yeah. But uh, it was rated X in the UK, meaning no one under age of 16 can uh, is permitted to watch. Also, another discussion was about Lolita's age, as we mentioned a bit before. Oh, I did a spoiler. Sorry. <laughs> the film is deliberately vague over Lolita's age. Kubrick himself commented, I think that some people had the mental picture of a nine-year-old, but Lolita was 12 and a half in the book. Now, Sue Leon, who, um, pro who portrays uh, Lolita in the movie, was actually 13, uh, but actually he, she was 14 by the time filming began, and 15 when the filming finished, and 16 when they were on tour for the movie. So, yeah, interesting fact now. The young Leon said, uh, uh, Leon said she has read the movie, the, the book, sorry. She has read the book before uh, she did the film, same as her mom. And her mom was also a fan of the book and knew Kubrick as a respectable and an artist director. So she, they were totally okay with doing the movie. Now, some interesting facts to keep you invested. There's a scene 
um, where Humbert plays chess with Lolita's mother. As Lolita kisses Humbert goodnight, his line in the scene is that, I take your queen, suggestive of his designs of her daughter. Now, the second interesting fact is that chess is a recurring motif uh, in the novels of Novakov and the favorite pastime of director Stanley Kubrick. So yeah, these are some interesting fact. Now in the end, the movie was generally well received, mostly because of its slight humor and amazing performances, scoring 93% on Rotten Tomatoes. Presented to you by my favorite mug. Oh, <laughs> it's it's London. I love it. <laughs> I have a very clear one. Mm, so simple. Okay, so. Hello. <laughs> we're back and this is uh, we have to say goodbye unfortunately but surely we'll be back next week to talk about more well known uh, Sally Kubrick movies aren't we Eleonora? oh yeah, yeah you're right <laughs> <laughs> because w we simply can't do this amazing director justice by just talking about him in one uh, one segment yeah, uh, one there are so part many movies. it's there are so many good movies and Kubrick is a, that kind of director that you have to talk about him deeply and also about his movies you know you have to talk about them I in... can't wait when we are going to talk about too fast and one space Odyssey really I and I also love uh, my one of my favorite favorite one is Barry Lyndon. I love that movie. I love that movie so much. It's so uh, those movies are so iconic. I can't wait to talk about them. Uh, so uh, before saying goodbye, let's head to our socials. You can find us on our Facebook page as Roma Tree Radio, on our Twitter account as Roma Tree Radio, on Instagram Roma Tree Radio. But remember, tree is a number. And you can listen to us on a streaming website as radio.uniromatree.it and on the Tunina app as Roma Tree Radio. Don't forget that you can also this find... was brought to you by... <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget that you can also find a podcast on the website as well and on um, the mi uh, Mixcloud, if I'm yep. not... Yeah. You can listen to our lovely voices 24-7. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't miss the previous uh, shows the, with their podcasts. Go listen to them. It's awesome, just like always. <laughs> so thank you very much for tuning in. Thanks to our uh, writers, uh, the whole team, not just me, Helio Bl the Blue Head, and Said, also Said and Julio, and also our perfect director, Marco. Marco. Hello, Marco. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you all the uh, thank you to you all the listeners for tuning in and we'll see you on the flip, flip side. side. <laughs> we almost did it. Andata! Cambiamo, cambiamo il server schermo. Il nostro compito adesso. <laughs> <laughs>